Let's let this thing roll, baby. What is your full name? My name is John Michael Zamoski. Okay. I grew up in Washington, D.C. and I was born in 1952, which makes me a baby boomer. I went to school in Washington to a boys prep school, land in the school for boys, then went off to school in Virginia to become a gentleman at Washington and Lee University and uh, finished there, then went on to work for an advertising agency in Washington for about a year until the time I had the opportunity to interview at The Greatest Show on Earth. Okay, Talk for that. We're going to restate, okay, because we're going to get to that later in more detail, okay? So some of this may be redundant to you. Fine. Okay. Um, how old are you now? I'm 58 years old, or 58 years young. Okay. And where do you live? I live in New York on Long Island, and I've lived in New York for the last 31 years since Ringling Brothers put me there. Okay. Have you had any other nicknames as an adult? If so, what were they? My nickname throughout my career has just been simply Z. Okay. Um, what is the name on your birth certificate? John Michael Zamoski is the name on my birth certificate. Okay. When and where were you born? I was born in Washington, D.C., one of those rare people who was actually born there. Okay. And, and on what day and year? I was born on June 7th, 1952. Okay. Um, where did you live as a child? I was born in Washington, D.C. and lived there till I was two years old. But then we moved to Chevy Chase, Maryland, which was just over the border into Maryland by one block. Okay. Uh, would you describe your family as poor, middle class, upper class, or very wealthy? I would say that we were an upper class family living in a nice neighborhood in a nice little three bedroom house. Um, what was your father's occupation? My dad, who came from Baltimore, Maryland, was in the wholesale distributing business. And interestingly, he distributed records. Uh, and that was their business from the 1930s. Okay. Uh, what was your mother's occupation? My mom, as well as being uh, a homemaker, was also a graphic artist who studied in uh, Pittsburgh and in Philadelphia and worked for department stores doing ads. Okay. And going back to your father's uh, distributing business and records in particular, uh, did your father have any uh, record distribution commercial relationship with Urban Feld? You know, interestingly, my dad's record distribution business uh, was the reason that I met the Feld family. My family distributed records to the Super Music City store in Washington, D.C., which uh, made it interesting for me because I interacted with the Feld family from the time I was a kid. Okay. Um, what schools have you attended and where were they located? And ask, tell me if they're public or private. Okay. The schools that I... Right. I uh, attended the Landon School for Boys in Bethesda, Maryland from the time I was in third grade wearing a coat and tie uh, through 12th grade, boys prep school, and then went on to Washington and Lee University uh, for my undergraduate work, and then American University for graduate school uh, afterwards in a professionals program. Okay. Um, how many years of education have you completed? I like to think of myself as uh, a lifetime learner, but my formal education finished with graduate school. So I went through that point with my MBA program. Okay. And when did you complete your MBA? I completed my MBA program in 1976, just prior to going to work for Ringling Brothers. Um, okay, we're going to talk about your uh, career a little bit. Uh, we're going to start out as uh, obviously during your childhood years, because those are formative. As a child, what uh, did you want to be when you grew up? Most kids probably had a pretty good idea of what they wanted to be when they grew up. I knew what I didn't want to be. Uh, I didn't want to work in the distributing business. I did work in the clothing business in high school. I worked for the New York Times assembling papers in the middle of the night to deliver to, uh, uh, to different places on the weekends on Saturday night. I drove a truck uh, where I delivered shoes between uh, 
stores when I was in high school. Through college, I thought that I wanted to be in the broadcasting business. And I started by working behind the mic. And then I realized what I wanted to do was go into the marketing business after college because I enjoyed much more the writing, the production, and putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Okay. Uh, what was your first job? My first job out of college was for an advertising agency. I was a copywriter and that morphed into being an account executive as well. And interestingly, that's what put me back in touch with the Feld family. Uh, I was working for Harmony Hut Record Stores where I was the account executive. And the gentleman who I worked for, his name was Stu Schwartz. Stu Schwartz's sister was married to a gentleman named Alan Bloom at Feld Entertainment. Okay, and that would be Susan? I, uh, Susan Bloom, married to Alan Bloom, uh, was my connection to meet Alan Bloom again as a grown up. Okay. Um, how did you find out about the job with Ringling Brothers or Feld Entertainment? I was given the opportunity to go to work for Harmony Hut Record Stores to leave the advertising agency that I was in. And Harmony Hut Record Stores was owned by Schwartz Brothers Record Distributors. Well, Schwartz Brothers Record Distributors was the competing record distributor to my father's distribution firm. Although I was flattered with the opportunity to go to work for Schwartz Brothers, I told them I couldn't do so. Stu Schwartz said to me, I knew that was going to be the case. There's a job open at my brother-in-law's company, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Combined Shows, Inc., and I think that you and Alan Bloom would get along great. I'd like to set up an interview for you. And that's how I walked back in the door at 1015 18th Street, Northwest in Washington, D.C. Um, what was the interview like when you joined Feld? When I went up there to interview, I was very impressed by the surroundings. I went in, I sat down with Alan Bloom, who said to me, you're Joe's son, because he knew my father. And I said, yes. He said, what the hell do you want to do working here? I said, I want your job. At which point, Alan Bloom got up from his chair, said, you can have it right now. Is there anything else that you remember about your interview with Alan Bloom? In my interview, Alan asked me a couple of questions. He knew my background from his brother-in-law based on what I had already done. And he said to me, what do you think you would like to be doing in five years? And I said, I would like to be feeling like what I did made a difference. And he listened and he said, in what way? I said, I'd like to do things that are measurable. He said, we're measurable in every way. I said, I know, and that's the exciting part of it. He said, you know what? It's worth a shot. Let's see how you do. And that was the end of the interview. Um, what do you remember most about the marketing or the promoter job during your years with the organization? The thing that I remember the most about the marketing job was the independence, the trust that the company put in you to go out there and represent the company and represent the brand. It gave you an incredible amount of both power and it gave you an incredible amount of confidence to go and do a job. You knew that you could actually make a difference and make an impact. Who was the person that had the most positive influence on your work while at Feld? Uh, who were they and what did they do? When I was at Feld, probably the most important person who had an influence on me was Irvin Feld. Because Irvin Feld didn't like rules. He liked to make them, he liked to break them. And during the entire six years I was there, he encouraged me to take chances. He once said to me, it's okay to stick your neck out. You are gonna get it chopped off once in a while, but all the times that you take the chance and you do something great, 
takes care of the times that you do get your neck chopped off. So Ervinfeld really did make a difference for me. Um, it has been said that the Ringling Promoters laid the foundation for live event marketing uh, uh, in recent years, decades I'll say. Uh, others have said that it should be studied by advertising and marketing students. Uh, what was it that you did that was so uniquely special? You know, it's interesting. Most marketing is split up into areas of marketing. Advertising, publicity, promotion, media buying, creative. What made the Ringling experience unique was the fact that it was the first case of integrated marketing. You didn't look at it by the piece, you looked at the sum total of what you were doing. What they talk about today, about doing pulsed marketing, what they talk about in strategic alliances, what they talk about in promotion, what they talk about in PR, not only did you look at it from its individual standpoint, what you looked at was how each thing interacted with each other in order to make one plus one not equal three, but equal five. That's the basis of good, strong marketing today in a fragmented marketplace. And I don't care what type of a brand that you're marketing, you can learn from the Ringling Brothers' experience of that time. Um, Ringling supervisors were mentors, but they were also notoriously tough. What was it like when you, know, you were being trained and working within the group? I had a wonderful experience with the supervisors because the supervisors looked at you and they could tell whether you were actually getting it. Although a lot of people talk about how tough the supervisors were, and I eventually became one of those supervisors, what they really did was they taught you to think in more than one direction. A lot of people talk about how tough they were. I don't think that they were tough. I think they were exacting and I think they were specific because they understood that this was a system and if you could learn the system then you could put it to work for you in the way that you need it. You know I like to say to people who I hire in my own business when they come out of college young like I was at that time, I want you to give me two years. The first year you're going to learn what you're doing. The second year you're going to understand why you're doing it. And I think the supervisors wanted to drill into you. And not more than thinking, I know it. They wanted to drill into you what to do first. And eventually you would understand why you were doing it because you would see the results. Um, it's been said that the Ringling promoters were and are a close knit group that uh, are almost tribal in nature. Uh, people have kept in touch over the years and maintained relationships. Has this been your experience? Over the past 35 years, since the day that I joined Ringling Brothers, I have had a close personal and working relationship over the years with so many of our band of brothers and band of brothers and sisters, as you would say. It's a unique bond. Uh, as an example, there is another promoter, his name is Joe Gold, and Joe Gold and I will do deals together sometimes. And I can tell you how often we will go into a meeting, not rehearse what we're doing. He'll start a sentence, I'll finish it. I'll start a sentence, he'll finish it. And we look at each other afterwards and we realize that we would each do it exactly the same way had it been complete on our part. There is a brotherhood here. There is an innate trust. And there is an understanding that we know how to get it done like nothing I have ever seen in any industry anywhere. Being an advanced man wasn't just a job, it was a life. That has been the description of it. Would, you would go into a city alone for weeks before the circus arrived. Uh, I want you to describe the feelings and what went through your head as you were, 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 were given a marketplace and you went in there uh, as a young man. When you were assigned a city, although you went in alone to that city, you didn't go in alone. 
you had an engagement book from the year prior. That's the first thing that you were armed with. And if you did your homework on the city you were going into, and I went to places I had never been in my life. I grew up on the East Coast. I had never traveled West. I had never been to Lexington, Kentucky. I had never been to Birmingham, Alabama, Fresno, California. There were places I had never been. But there was a familiarity born out of the fact that you had this book to start you off and get you started. And the process was that you would go into the city, you would make your deal hopefully on a barter basis with a hotel, you would pull out the yellow pages and start looking at who the big advertisers were. You would take the local media, the newspapers, and see who the big marketers were in the marketplace. You would talk to the advertising agency that you used in the past to place your media and get some perspective there. You would talk to the building management and you would take this puzzle and put it together and see what was the same, what had changed. You had this wonderful history that you would look at from the year prior. Or in a new market, you'd have to start from scratch without anything. But what you had was, is you had a process to work with. And for that, it was an adventure. It was putting the puzzle pieces together. And honestly, it was great. It was empowering. And you knew that you had a brand that was unbelievable. Many of us who were the road promoters were also fans of the show. You had a passion for the product. So we would travel during the week to the advanced cities and then we would go back to the shows on the weekends when we could, if they were nearby, and spend time with the show getting more intimately involved with the product itself and with the people because that made you a better marketer. Mm -hmm. um. We're going to talk about how this translated to life after Felder Entertainment and your subsequent careers. Um, what valuable lessons did you learn from the Ringling Feld experience? The lessons I... I think that probably the greatest lesson I learned from working with Feld that I carried through my career has been that marketing isn't brain surgery. It's good common sense put together with facts that you have to work with. We make it more painful than it has to be. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to take those puzzle pieces and apply it to a career that has been very satisfying for me. And it is entirely built on the things that I learned when I was with the Feld organization. Um. I'm not, this may be redundant, but I have to, I want, have to ask you this. How did you think the lessons you learned at Feld translated into future benefits or learnings for you? You know, interestingly, what I learned at Feld not only translated for me from a business standpoint, but it also translated for me from an academic standpoint. For 10 years, I taught at NYU in New York City, and I taught a course in sports and entertainment marketing. Once a week, well, every fall semester, and every lesson I learned from Feld was something I was able to translate into a classroom process that many people are using today that don't even realize that it's actually born from the Feld experience. So the value just keeps on growing for people who are in the marketing business today. Good, good point. Um, what types of uh, jobs and careers have you had since leaving Feld? And what year was that moment? Okay. I was with the show from 1976 to 1982. During that time, I took what I learned, I filed it away, and I was lucky enough to be at a very interesting point in our lifetime with the advent of the cable television business. When I was on the road with the show, people would come up to me and say in small towns around the country, give me 20 tickets to the circus, I'll give you a hundred spots on my cable system. And you know, I said at that time, what's a cable system? Well, when I left the show and joined with what was then my ad agency in New York, the first client that I brought in was Manhattan Cable TV, which was a 66,000 unit cable company in New York City. But what was interesting was they needed my help from a promotion standpoint and started introducing me to new networks that were about to launch. 
and one of the first ones was the Weather Channel. They hadn't even launched yet, they didn't exist yet. And they said, gee, your background is field marketing. How would you feel about training the people that we're hiring who are going to go in the field, who are going to sell this cable network to local cable operators? And that was the beginning of a career that has lasted now since that time for 28 years. Today, I represent more cable networks than any company in the world, developing and doing the marketing for them, and it's 100% based on Ringling Learning. Would you uh, um, care to elaborate on just a few of the names of the cable networks that you represent? I launched the Weather Channel and represented them for 20 years. I launched the Food Network. I launched Cinemax. Today I represent AMC Television, Lifetime Television, A&E, the History Channel, Showtime. I represent TNT for the Turner Networks, Sci-Fi Channel, Mundos in the Hispanic Sphere, Sprout Network. I represent the Outdoor Channel, Reels Channel. It's about 14 networks today that I represent, but interestingly, it was written about me once that I had written the marketing strategies enough marketing strategies to fill a, a tier in a cable box, but it's all based on ringling training, every bit of it. Um, you've obviously owned your own business and you've worked with someone else. Would you care to elaborate on, on how that all worked out? One of the most valuable lessons you learned at Ringling Brothers was to be what I termed an intrapreneur. You were a businessman within somebody else's company. You were rewarded, you were criticized based on your ability to be an entrepreneur but within a company of entrepreneurs. So you were working for the company. I became an intrapreneur and then eventually an entrepreneur. Uh, I like to say that I am unemployable. And the reason I say that I'm unemployable is I am used to being a self-starter. I'm used to going out and taking the bull by the horns. That's what I learned at Ringling Brothers. And to that extent, I don't need anybody to explain to me what to do. I just go out and do it according to a process and a system that was learned at Ringling Brothers. And luckily, that has, um, that has been able to support me, support my family. I have built agencies and I have sold agencies to public companies around the world and it all comes from Ringling Training. Um, how many times would you say you changed your, your career or were there permutations of it since you left Feld Entertainment? I think it's interesting to note that Although I went from Ringling to an advertising agency to a promotion firm to opening my own business, nothing that I did starting with Ringling Brothers has changed. It may have evolved, it may have expanded, but the basis of everything that I've done for the past 35 years hasn't changed a bit. It's been the application of the tools that I learned in the Ringling Brothers system and applying those to different types of brands and clients, but nothing has changed since I did that. And they are time tested, they are true, they are valid, and they are authentic. Um, uh, currently, do you own your own business or do you work for someone else? For the past 17 years, I've owned my own agencies. Although I did sell to another firm, I was only involved in that in what they call an earnout situation for a year and a half. But I have been a business owner for 17 years. When I left Feld, I spent some time working for other agencies as either a partial owner or as an executive. But for the most part, I've always thought of myself as being in business and being an owner of a business. It makes you think that way. Um, have you made enough money to? to live comfortably? I've been very fortunate. I like to think I've been lucky. I think like to think I've been smart. But I've been very fortunate in order 
in, in my ability to not only support myself but put away money uh, so that my kids are able to get out of college and out of law school and graduate school without having any debt. Uh, I have a comfortable living. I've secured my future. Um, have you won any special awards or prizes uh, during your career? And could you tell us a little bit about them and what are they for? Through the work that I've done, both in the marketing industry and the cable industry, I've been very fortunate in winning uh, a shelf full of awards for work that either my company has done or I've done or work we've been involved with. I've won uh, a Peabody Award uh, for work that I did for A&E Television Network. I've won an Emmy Award. I have won over uh, 50 CTAM Mark Awards from the Cable Television Marketing Association. I've won over a hundred Reggie Awards from the Promotion Marketing Association. And I've been fortunate enough to lead as the chairman of the board of both the Promotion Marketing Association and the Cable Television Marketing Association. Okay. Do you remember someone saying something to you? that had a big impact on how you lived your life. Uh, who was it and what was it? Probably the biggest impact that anybody ever had on me in saying something to me that made me believe that what I was doing was not okay, but it was really terrific. My dad, who was I like to think of him as a marketer himself. He was in the wholesale distributing business. And I said to him one day, you know, all I do is marketing. My friends who have become doctors who save people, what they do is important. And he looked at me and he said, you know what? He said, marketers don't cure cancer, but what they do is they find the words that get people to care enough to donate the money to the causes that will cure cancer. So don't ever think that what you're doing isn't important. And that's probably the one thing that has made me feel that what I do, although it may not be primarily important, some of the things that I can do can have lasting value. Um, what was the happiest event in your experience with Feld? The happiest event for me, because I lived what I did with the shows, was for me, I came to one of the cities, skip this, I, I, can I go back for a second? Okay. Sorry. What was the happiest okay. event? in your experience with Felt? The happiest event for me, which was confirmation of being part of not just a company, but also a family with Felt, was on my birthday in 1980 in Lexington, Kentucky, where I was doing the work for the show, that I was walking down the track, the outer track of the show, and three of the clowns came up and hit me with pies in the face on my birthday. And what it did was it took me from being an outsider who just hopped on and off the show to somebody who was part of this family that I felt so strongly about. And that was probably the pure, purest happiness that I ever felt because I had been accepted by the people as opposed to just being utilized by the people in the show. What was the saddest moment in your experience with Feld? The saddest experience for me with Feld was the day that I left. Because although I knew it was time, and although I knew I could go out and do what I wanted to do at that point, it was so sad because I knew, I, though I needed to do it, I would never feel this way about the people I worked with for the rest of my life. 
And that's been the case. Although I've had people work for me and with me, although I've worked for a multitude of clients, the happiest days of my life, professionally, were working within that organization. Okay. Um, what is the most amazing thing that has ever happened to you? People ask you what is the most amazing thing that's ever happened to you. I guess the standard answer is the birth of my children. But I think that although that is the case, you can put that aside and you could look at other experiences. For me, the most amazing experience that's happened to me is the ability to make friends and maintain them over a lifetime and trust those friends. That's the most amazing thing. It's been the life journey and experience for me of making friendships and connections. What has been the most stressful experience that you've ever lived through and what helped you get through it? The most stressful experience I ever went through was in 2008 when the market crashed. And during a two week period, I lost 35% of the business in my company. And it wasn't stressful from a financial standpoint for me personally. I felt that because we had lost the business and I had to let people go who depended on me, that I had failed them. And I sat down and I cried. I cried for days because I didn't want to let these people go. I felt that I hadn't held up my end of the bargain, which was, as long as you do your job, I will make sure that you're in a safe harbor. And the stress was, I had made a mistake. And the mistake was that I had several clients that represented too much as a percentage of my business. And in losing that business, it made me realize that you can never be that dependent on anybody else. And how I got through it was, I literally put my nose to the grindstone because I had a choice of closing up shop or figuring out a solution. And I put my nose to the grindstone and today in my business there is no client that represents more than 4% of my company's business. Making it pretty much bulletproof unless everybody wakes up the same day and decides to fire me. What advice do you have for your children or your eventual grandchildren? My advice for my kids, my grandkids, and anybody, whether they're family or not, do what you're passionate about and you will be successful. Because passion means that you're not doing a job, you're doing what you love. If you do what you love, you're gonna eventually find success in that because it becomes part of you. It's not what you do, it becomes who you are. What I do for a living is who I am. It's as a part of my DNA as anything else about me. So my advice is to my kids, my grandkids is, find something you love and do it. It sustained me and it'll sustain you. Do you have any regrets? People ask me if I have any regrets. Um, I think we all have certain levels of regret. I guess my biggest regret is that I couldn't stay within the Ringling system and do what I wanted to do. I wish I could have, but I needed to move on in order to grow. That's the only regret I have. I regret things that I can't control sometimes, but you really regret the things that you can control, and that's the one regret I have. I, I regret that I left, but not enough that I shouldn't have done it. If you could go back and change anything, what would it be? If I could change anything, and I guess that question gets asked to a lot of people, I don't think I would. 
I look back and I've been very, very fortunate. I wouldn't change a thing about my career, about my family, about my life, because I feel that everything is a building and a growing experience. Thank you very much. This has been the oral history of John Samoski, uh, taken on uh, the, I believe, the 12th day of February, 2011.